Hey there and welcome to this video. In the following I'll be doing a paper explanation of VQGAN, which stands for Vector Quantized Generative Adversarial Networks. Yes, that's a tongue breaker, but it's actually a pretty cool model for image generation. The authors took a lot of existing methods and combined them in an amazing way to produce images as the ones you can see here. One special thing is that this model can generate images much larger than it was trained on. They trained on resolutions of 256 and were able to generate images in the megapixel regime by adding a couple cool tricks as you will see later. So let's get started. The VQGAN model is an extension of the VQVAE model and simply integrates it into the usual GAN architecture. I will quickly do a recap of the VQVAE model here, however if you want to dive deeper into it I will leave some resources in the description. VQVAE stands for Vector Quantized Variational Autoencoder. A variational autoencoder is no more than a fancy autoencoder and an autoencoder is a model for learning a compression of some data. The end goal is to be able to generate new samples from your data distribution. Usually this is done for images. So let's take an example. Say you have a whole bunch of images of flowers. Your goal is now to generate new flowers from your data distribution, which simply means to generate new images of flowers which could occur in your training data. So the idea behind an autoencoder is to learn a mapping, or which is also called an encoding, from the image space to a low dimensional latent space. This latent space usually has a dimension of 256, sometimes less, sometimes more. After mapping the image to the latent space, the image will be reconstructed or decoded by a mapping from the latent space to the image space. We will refer to the mapping as the encoder and the decoder. Both the encoder and the decoder can be simple convolutional architectures. To be more precise, the encoder could take in an image of size 512 by 512 and map it to a latent space which has a dimension of 256. After that, the decoder would take in the 256 dimensional latent space and try to reconstruct the image and map it back to the original 500 by 512 image space. To train this you would take some sort of reconstruction loss which compares the original image to the reconstructed image. Great, so now you have learned what an autoencoder does in a nutshell. The variational autoencoder is just an extension of this and just reparameterizes the latent space to predict means and standard deviations. The reason for that is that the original autoencoder is using the latent space kind of not as we wish. In short, the latent space of images which are similar to each other do not lie close to each other in the latent space. So an image of the same flower, just taken from another angle, could lie miles apart in the latent space, which is not intended for a lot of reasons. The second problem is that the distribution is not centered in the latent space, so the latent vectors of images could lie literally everywhere. With everywhere I mean vectors like this. However, we would want them to be close to the origin to have them in a similar scale. So this is where the VAE comes into play. As I already said, it reparameterizes the latent space to be centered around the origin, plus to have images lie around similar images. If you want to know how this is exactly done, you can take a look at the video description. So that's all good and nice, but why do we need to go further and introduce VQVAE? The main advantage that VQVAE adds is that it turns the latent representation of your data into a discrete one. The normal VAE simply learns a continuous latent space where all values could be taken and decoded back to an image. However, this would result in a massive number of points which could be hard to properly learn by the VAE. Instead, we would like to restrict the possible number of latent vectors so that the model can concentrate on these. And due to the sparsity of data and the discrete nature of classes, turning this problem into a discrete one favors the learning process and results in better outcomes. To realize this, we make use of vector quantization. The idea is to learn what's called a codebook. This codebook consists of a discrete number of vectors which all share the same dimensionality. You can imagine this as having our 256 dimensional latent space again, however this time just a certain number of points can be taken and these are vectors from our codebook. So having our codebook established, what we do is the following. After encoding an image to our latent space, we take this vector and replace it by its nearest neighbor from the codebook. For example, imagine that our codebook has 100 vectors, which are all of dimension 256. After feeding our image through the encoder, we take the resulting 256 dimensional latent vector and look which vector from the codebook is its closest neighbor and replace it with that. I should mention that in practice this will be a bit more complex as that our encoder outputs not only one vector, 
but multiple. And then each of these vectors will be replaced by their corresponding nearest neighbor. This just increases the number of possible latent vectors. Otherwise, if we were to have 100 codebook vectors, we could only learn 100 image compressions. However, by letting our encoder output multiple latent vectors for each image, we drastically increase the number of possible image compressions. Think of outputting 32 vectors instead of just one. This for each of the 32 vectors could be replaced by 100 different codebook vectors and this results in a pretty big number. So this is essentially all there is to say about the VQVAE and its benefits over the standard VAE. To make this work in practice though, we need to add some tricks, for example to our loss. However, since this also applies to our VQGAN, I will come back to this later. The other method VQGAN is making use of is to convert our problem into the GAN regime by introducing a discriminator to our training. If you are not familiar with GANs, let me quickly do a summary of how they work. GANs consist of two neural networks which compete against each other. One is the generator, which as the name suggests generates our new samples, in our case images. On the other hand, we have the discriminator, which acts as the detective to distinguish the real images contained in our dataset from the fake ones that the generator created. This results into what is called a min-max problem and simply means that the generator is trying to push the loss into one direction and the discriminator tries to push it into the opposite one. In other words, the generator aims to fool the discriminator into thinking that his images are also coming from the real distribution and the discriminator tries to avoid this. This training procedure results into the generator becoming better and better at approximating the original data and has turned out to result in a huge line of research and amazing results. Coming back to the VQGAN, this is also exactly what is happening here. Our encoder converts our image into the latent space. The latent vectors will be replaced by its nearest neighbors from the codebook and the decoder takes this latent representation and converts it back to the image space as usual. Then we take some reconstruction loss and have our VQVAE part ready. Now additionally, we also have a discriminator in our training loop which takes in the reconstructed images and the original images and tries to distinguish between the real and fake ones. This provides some additional information to our encoder and decoder as to how they have to change according to fool the discriminator and hence mimic the original data distribution better. You can imagine this as the discriminator being an additional supervisor for our encoder and decoder which gives his opinion on the generated images and tells it via the loss and its gradient how to do better. With this setup we can now train our VQGAN model to learn to reconstruct images by first encoding them to our latent space and afterwards decoding it back to our image space. But we said that our main goal would be to generate completely new images from our data distribution and not just reconstruct images which we already have. And that's where the second stage of the VQGAN starts. You see how every image is encoded to a latent space and after that it's replaced with the closest codebook vectors, right? Say we have a lot of images of flowers with a green background, representing some leaves or so. Our encoding process, so the encoding of the image and the codebook mapping, would learn this pattern and would assign specific code Book vectors for a green background. The same holds for other types of backgrounds, say sky or water or even the parts of a flower, for example the color or the shape. All these things are learned and are in some sense represented in our codebook. You can also imagine our codebook as a toolbox for constructing flowers. If we want to create a flower which has a red flower head, a long green stem, big green leaves and a blue background for our sky, we simply take all these things out of our toolbox and fuse them together to build our flower. And this is exactly what the transformer part is used for. It learns which codebook vectors could make sense together and which not. And after that it can generate new possible codebook vectors which it thinks could go along together. We are using a transformer because our codebook vectors representing an image is just a sequence and transformers are really good at sequence tasks. Furthermore, I mentioned at the beginning of the video that you could create images which are way bigger than the original training images. The reason for that is both the encoder and the decoder are fully convolutional architectures and as a result are invariant to image sizes. Technically only the decoder is used for this and the transformer will sample more latent vectors than usual in an autoregressive manner. Check out the video description for more details. And that's basically it. You have now learned the key idea behind VQGAN. Congratulations! In the following I will get into a bit more details concerning the actual training and architecture of the models. However before that, if you are interested in a coding tutorial for actually implementing the VQGAN and Python using PyTorch, you can take a look at the video description or at the eye in the top right corner to get to my explanation video for how to implement the VQGAN model in PyTorch. The VQGAN model consists of four sub-models. 
They are the encoder, decoder, the codebook and the discriminator. The authors use simple CNN architectures for both the encoder and decoder. The encoder starts off with a normal convolutional layer and then adds M residual blocks and downsample blocks. After another ResNet block, a non-local block is added. If you have never heard about it, don't worry, it's just sort of an attention block, just with a different name. It was introduced by Facebook AI Research in 2018. I will link the paper below if you want to check it out. At the end, we add a group norm, a switch activation and another convolutional layer to map to our latent space. All in all, the encoder has about 22 million parameters. On the other hand, the decoder is essentially the same as the encoder, just in reverse. And obviously, instead of downsample blocks, we use upsample blocks. However, it is also way bigger and has about 42 million parameters. This comes from adding more residual blocks and non-local blocks than the encoder. The discriminator they used is from the PatchCan paper. Other than usual discriminators, PatchCan focuses only on rough structures and classifies each n by n patch as real or fake. In general, it is also just a convolutional architecture consisting of blocks of convolutions, batch norm and a leaky ReLU. The codebook actually is not really a model as it just consists of n codebook vectors and performs a mapping from any input vector to the closest vectors from the codebook. Internally, this is represented as an embedding matrix which is also learned over the course of training. Make sure to check out my implementation video if you want to know how this is exactly done. The second stage only consists of a transformer which is a GPT architecture, so a decoder only. Specifically, they use MinGPT which is just a tiny version of the actual GPT models by OpenAI. The first training stage is performed in an end-to-end -end fashion, meaning that everything is learned at the same time. Our loss function consists of the following two parts. The first loss is exactly the same as in the original VQVAE paper. It consists of a reconstruction loss and the two parts for the vector quantization. The reconstruction loss includes both a pixel-wise mean squared error, or L2 loss, and a perceptual loss. The procedure of a perceptual loss is that you feed both the real image and the reconstructed image through a pre-trained network. In our case, the authors used a V. GG16. And then you take the difference between these features. That way the model is supposed to learn not only to be precise on a pixel-wise manner, but also to focus on keeping semantic information of images. The last two terms that you see here are for the codebook mapping. SG stands for stop gradient and means not to calculate the gradient for this item. This however is just something relevant for the practical implementation, so don't worry if you don't understand it. You can also see that the two terms are the same except that the stop gradient is at a different position. The first term ensures that the codebook vectors will be changed more towards the encoder output and the second term enforces that the encoder outputs vectors closer to the codebook. So you can imagine it that both the encoder outputs and codebook vectors will be brought closer together in latent space so that the replacing of the encoder output by the corresponding codebook vectors will not result in a huge change. The second loss for the GAN part and is a normal GAN loss where the discriminator tries to correct the classified real images from fake ones. In this exact formula the discriminator will try to classify real images as 1 and fake images as 0. Taking the logarithm of it simply ensures numerical stability. Fusing the two parts together results in the following loss. Lambda is a weighting factor which is computed in each iteration by the following formula. The transformer training can be formulated as the following. You encode an image to the latent space and map it to the codebook vectors. Then you randomly replace some of the codebook vectors by other random codebook vectors. And the transformer is supposed to recognize these wrong codebook vectors and correct them. So you feed the modified codebook vectors into the transformer and take the output and compare it to the original codebook vectors, the ones before the random replacement. The transformer is trained by optimizing the cross entropy loss between the unmodified codebook vectors and the modified ones. And that's it. You now understand the theory behind the popular VQGAN model. However, theory is not all and you should definitely go and check out the implementation video link down below. And with that being said, I wish you a nice day.